Good evening. I'm Linda Zecker, uh, CEO of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, and I'm very honored to be here tonight to introduce you to an amazing group of women who will lead tonight's discussion. And this evening's topic is really a vital one that is really very close to my heart. As a female CEO, I'm also, you know, I'm often asked to comment about what it's like to be a woman in an industry that has been traditionally been men, what it's like to be a woman and, and a leader and how you really help young women and things like that. And so many times I'm asked, you know, what are some of the experiences that I draw on and who do I draw them from? And I often say that it's, you know, it's women that I've drawn experiences from, it's things that I've read, it's people that I've talked to, it's people that I've met. But at the end, it's really all about stories and the storytelling of your experiences. And that's really what I think, you know, tonight's about. It's the power of a great story. And there are so many women that are doing so many important things and so much great work in the world, whether it's policy, whether it's business, whether it's in human rights, whether it's in education. And we stop to think about it, and if we listen to all of their diverse voices, we can learn so much, and it can really, I think, change the way we look at the world in the future. So in this book, Fast Forward, it's How Women Can Achieve Power and Purpose by Milan Vivier and Kim Azzarelli. And it really is about harnessing the power of storytelling and how it has inspired others, giving us a gift of more than 70 interviews that they've done about the trailblazing of women in the corporate space and beyond. So I'm really thrilled to welcome them here, and I'm very proud of the fact that we had the opportunity to really be able to produce this book. So Ambassador Milan Vivier is a founder of the Seneca Woman and Executive Director of Georgetown University's Institute of Women, Peace, and Security. In 2009, President Obama appointed her as the first ever United States Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues. She is co-founder of Vital Voices, an international nonprofit that invests in emerging women's leaders. Kim Azzarelli is also a founder of Seneca Women and is co-founder and chair of the Cornell Law School's Aval Avon, I'm sorry, Global Center for Women and Justice. She is a legal, corporate, and philanthropic advisor and has held senior positions at companies including Newsweek, Daily Beast, Goldman Sachs, and Avon. Moderating this evening, we are very pleased and very excited to introduce Jill Abramson, lecturer at Harvard University and former executive editor of the New York Times, and quite the icon in journalism. Ms. Abramson spent the last 17 years in the most senior editorial positions at the New York Times, where she was the first woman to serve as Washington bureau chief, managing editor, and executive editor. Before joining the Times, she spent nine years at the Wall Street Journal and Deputy, bureau, Deputy Washington Bureau Chief and an investigative reporter covering money and politics. She is the author of three books, including Strange Justice, which she co-authored with Jane Mayer. So we are very excited to have the opportunity to have these wonderful women here tonight. But before we jump into the evening's discussion, I would also like to recognize some of our sponsors. On behalf of the Kennedy Library Foundation, I would like to acknowledge the very generous underwriters of the Kennedy Library Forums, lead sponsor Bank of America and the Lowell Institute, the Boston Foundation and the Foundation's media partners, the Boston Globe, Xfinity, and WBUR. We would also like to acknowledge the Mass Women's Forum, our forum partner this evening. So thank you again, and I hope you enjoy the evening. So before we start the discussion, we are going to have a short video, so hopefully you'll enjoy the evening. Thank you. We are at a point today where we know that women are the agents of change in economies in this country and around the world. We know that the data is in, that women are critical to driving both economic and social progress. We're powerful. We're the majority in the ballot box, we're the majority in college, we're now the majority of breadwinners, we're the majority in the workforce. Women are controlling or influencing around $20 trillion in purchasing power. As women are ascending to power, they're increasingly using their power for purpose. Women are, in the process, redefining what power means. I think when we say gain power, the idea is gaining a practical ability to affect change. If we look in the continuum from gaining power to a happier life and ultimately to a more satisfactory and meaningful life, we want to translate that power into a purpose, and the purpose being the service of others. It is my duty, my obligation, 
but also my privilege to help other women to empower themselves. Tell every woman they can be the woman they want to be. I think it's important for women to network. You have to develop a cadre of people around you who face the same challenges you faced. I call those groups the Nourish Your Soul groups. Let's unlock the unlimited potential of every woman. The young girls, they have their dreams. The more they can dream, the more they can imagine, that's the kind of world they can create. Empowering women to unleash their talents and perspectives is critical for our world. What we found is that there's really a formula. It's know your own power, find your purpose, what motivates you, what gives you meaning, and then to connect with others. Find like-minded people who share your passion, share your goals. Investing in women and girls can fast forward us to the world we want to see. to begin just by thanking the John F. Kennedy Library for hosting this event, which is focused on women and their achievements, their power and purpose. And to say I'm thrilled, we have a large group of uh, students uh, here tonight. And I think that um, this book, Fast Forward, has a lot of practical advice in it about how you can find your power and your purpose. So it's great to have um, a youth contingent with us. And you know, I, I wanted M Milan to start with you, and if you could give us a, a little bit of background. Why, why did you want to write, write fast forward? And uh, if you can, tell us what the secret for achieving our power and purpose is. <laughs> well, before I do that, Jill, uh, let me just say uh, what a privilege it is for me to be here with you. Uh, Jill, as I think everybody should know, is one of the great journalists of our time and certainly uh, one of the greatest female journalists. Uh, and I have come to know her over the years, respect what she has achieved. Um, but what touches me most is the young reporters I know uh, young women reporters who have told me what it's like to be able to work with her, to walk in her office, to be inspired by her. So, Jill, you, you are somebody who has fast-forwarded the next generation. So thank you for that. I also want to mention, since she didn't, uh, that Linda Zecker, who introduced our evening uh, as the head of Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, is the first women to, woman to run that company and it's a 185 year history. So I hopefully other progress won't take as long. Um, and then a personal note. Um, for me, it's very meaningful to come here uh, to the Kennedy Library because when I was a youngster, younger than some of the girls in this room or young women in this room, uh, he was really my inspiration. And um, I often feel for many in my generation the call to public service, the call to ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, um, really inspired a whole generation of us. And so for me to come here tonight and talk about how we can fast forward purpose and we can fast forward meaning in many ways and making a difference, he had so much to do with that in my own life. Why this book? Um, I have had... Um, many years of uh, opportunities to work with women at home and around the world, uh, working uh, with the private sector, uh, in government for the most part, and in the nonprofit uh, sector. And um, out of that has come an accumulation of experiences uh, that I thought were worth sharing. But particularly in recent years, uh, one of them was when I first met Kim, where obviously we spanned two generations. And I was at the time running an organization called Vital Voices, uh, which invests in emerging women leaders. It was something that came out of the Clinton administration where it was part of uh, the State Department in those years that Hillary Clinton had a major role in. Uh, but then it was going to end, and women 
around the globe with whom we work said you can't, you can't end this. Uh, what's going to happen to us? We need to come together. We need to uh, be able to have the kinds of opportunities and uh, see the possibilities. And I was raising money for that nonprofit, as is common for nonprofits. And I went to New York, uh, and I went to Avon. And I met uh, the young uh, lawyer there who was the corporate secretary, who was very close to the, the head of the company. And I started to tell her that I thought today uh, companies really, a company like Avon, which had as its clientele mostly women, women employees, uh, really increasingly should not be doing this kind of work as charity or philanthropy or even corporate social responsibility, but as a brand, as part of their brand, who they are. And in many ways, Avon's been doing that. And she completely agreed. And the colleague with whom I, I went to this meeting said to me, oh my God, she's one of us. And so her, Kim coming out of the corporate legal sector and my spending much of my efforts in the public sector actually brought several perspectives together, but we were working for the same ends to advance women and girls in the work that we were doing and increasingly doing it not just in a silo, but in a very integrated way. Uh, and over those years, both of us have met extraordinary people, men and women, who have been part of this. Uh, that's what the book's about in many ways. Uh, we also did some 60 additional interviews. Um, really understanding with the breakthroughs that are happening today, uh, and that's the predicate for the book, which is that we have a chance today like never before far more women in positions of responsibility at every, every level, not where we need to get, no. Is it still hard? Yes. But in ways that we have come a long way, we have a evidence-based case for why investing in women and girls has tremendous dividends for economic and social progress, and we can talk about that, but it is from the World Economic Forum to the World Bank to many of the companies are producing massive uh, research and data on this. And we can be connected today through technological breakthroughs as we've never been. And so if you really care about advancing women and girls, not just because it's a women's issue, and it's really an issue for everybody because of what it means for each person and what it means for our world, we believe we should seize this moment and fast forward the progress if we all come together, if we understand that each of us has power, no matter where we sit, if we find our purpose, what really makes us passionate, and then connect with others. Uh, there's far more we can achieve, and we can collectively really make an enormous difference. That's why we wanted to write this book, and that's why we did. One of the things that I loved about your book is that it's big picture in a lot of ways, but it, it ha it's filled with wonderful, sometimes wrenching stories about women around the world and, and, and girls. And Kim, I, I, I was very uh, moved and so glad that you put it near the front of the book by, by the story of um, Sophie and you know the the problem of you know attacks on <coughs> women around the world a terrible problem but in this case specifically acid attacks yeah. and do, do you mind sharing that story? No, no, I, I'm happy to share that story. But I also have to say I, I, it's such a pleasure to be here and. To have Jill read our book was a real nerve-wracking thing. <laughs> so it's it's one thing to have you know Nonsense. put out a book. It's another for the executive <laughs> editor of New York Times and this unbelievably uh, powerhouse in media read your book. So Jill, thank you for being here with us, and uh, and Linda, thank you for for, for putting this book out. Um, so that story for me really sums up the book, and I think you know I'll probably share part of this answer with Milan because I think uh, Sophie for me uh, cha really changed my life. Uh, she was, she is, 
now almost 10 years old, but she was then a six-week-old baby who had been doused with acid Ugh. while she was breastfeeding with her mother in Cambodia. And I won't, won't give the whole book away, but uh, there was some sort of marital dispute of some sort, and um, uh, a woman had come uh, and had wanted to move in to uh, her mother's home with, uh, with the father and, and the child. I guess she was maybe having an affair with the father. And uh, the mother said, no, you, you can't, you know, you can't live with us. And she said, well, uh, she kept coming back every day. And so she gave her some money to go away. Whatever money she had, she gave it to her. And the woman went to the market, bought some acid, and came back and threw acid at the mother and the mm -hmm. child while she was breastfeeding. And the, the child was um, blinded. Uh, and the mother was uh, doused with acid on a third of her body, lost part of her ear. I, at the time, was working at Avon, as um, Milan had pointed out. Um, the company for women in the business of direct selling and the business of empowering women through the direct selling model. And I was actually born into the women's movement. My mother was very involved with the women's centers. Um, I actually went to nursery school in the women's center. So I wasn't new to these types of issues. But I was invited by the, one of the doctors you saw in the video, Dr. Ebi Olahi, who had just come back from Cambodia. He's an ocular plastic surgeon and was operating as a volunteer uh, when he came across this concept of the acid ward in Cambodia. So it wasn't just Sophie. There was a whole ward full of acid violence victims, mostly women. Mm. And the idea is that uh, oftentimes women are doused with acid because they want to steal a woman's beauty. It's the kind of erosive thing that is so disfiguring mm. uh, and scarring. He had just come back, um, and he was talking about this issue at, the, at Rockefeller University, and I went to a panel much like this. Um, and I walked in thinking I was going to hear some interesting, interesting anecdotes. And I walked out, when I saw the image of that baby, my whole perspective changed. And I thought, how could this be happening? How could there be a six-week-old baby doused with acid and no penalty? I, you know, I'm a lawyer. I kind of have a you know, dedication to justice. I could not believe that there was no penalty for the crime and that the perpetrator was just out and about. And I was at Avon at the time, and uh, I felt I could use my platform for something. I thought, well, clearly I'm a lawyer. I work at the Company for Women. There's got to be something I can do. And one thing led to another, which I'll uh, let you read in the book, but um, this child created this ripple effect, and a lot of it had to do with Dr. Alahi. I mean, he's an unbelievable figure, such a dedicated surgeon and doctor and philanthropist, and he basically galvanized a group of people, um, Mount Sinai, uh, and a whole bunch of surgeons volunteered their time. The uh, Virtue Foundation, which he's involved with, brought the child and other over. I was able to bring a whole bunch of resources, and we brought the issue to the UN. But what was amazing, it was in 2005, and you had mentioned 2005 in the green room, uh, I tried to get someone to cover the issue at the UN. We couldn't get one reporter there. Uh, actually, we did get one reporter from New York One. Journalists. There was nobody <laughs> interested in this issue of, of you know, what was going on for mm -hmm. girls um, and, and this issue of acid violence. But what happened as a result of that experience was little by little, a bunch of people came together and sort of the end of this, towards the end of the story, we were able to create a center for women in justice at Cornell. Justice O'Connor heard about the story, she supported us. One thing led to another, and it became this ripple effect of what we call a purpose coalition. So but, Sophie is a little bit like a, a precursor of Malala. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely, and what's mm -hmm. amazing about it is that I went in thinking, and this is on a very personal level, I thought I was helping Sophie, and I was helping this issue. And actually, we were able to change the laws in Cambodia. We were able to, I mean, significant things happen. But I think all of us got so much more out of it. I know, for me, it changed the whole way I thought about my work and in my life. And I thought I was helping her. And ultimately, it was me, it was I who was getting the most help from the whole thing. And, you know, we, we talk about in the book how when you go out, you know, there's the data that Milan talked about, the data about why investing in women and girls makes such incredible economic and social sense, and it's empirical, and I'm sure we'll talk about it from McKinsey to the World Bank. But the other thing that's in the book, which is really interesting, is the data on how to have a meaningful life, and how when you get out of yourself, and you use your skills for something bigger than yourself, that creates a sort of level of meaning in your life that you can't fulfill in any other way. And for me, Sophie was the beginning of that journey. It's an, an amazing story. Yeah. But since you mentioned McKinsey, yes. uh, you know, Sheryl Sandberg, who, of course, some of you know from reading her book, Lean In, uh, 
and she's a major executive at Facebook. She worked with McKinsey and commissioned a study on women in the workplace. And the introduction to the study is written by Cheryl, was uh, published in the Wall Street Journal some months ago. And she pointed out that uh, you could send a woman into space and have her orbit Jupiter 10 times, return to Earth, and it would still take many, many decades for women to achieve parity uh, in our society here in the United States and certainly around the world. And, you know, Kim, you've said you grew up in the women's movement virtually. I guess, you know, I'm very taken by the title of your book. And, you know, especially because Cheryl is making the point that you re we really, the pace, it just seems in almost every arena, um, there's been a bit of a stall, like women rose, but there are still, what, 14 um, women CEOs in the Very Fortune cute. 500. And, you know, if we're half the sky and mm -hmm. more than half the population of our country, you know, even with the number of women senators and House members, it's still relatively small percentage. So what happened? And, you know, how, how can we get it back on track so we can fast forward? Well, you know, that is part of the reason um, that we wanted to do the book, because we know uh, that we can't move forward at the pace we've moved. Um, I think there's been a study that says at the rate that we have uh, women elected to our own Congress, it would take a hundred years to over a hundred years to reach parity, and I, I think that's too long to wait to bring those experiences and perspectives, uh, and talents to public policy. Uh, you know, you can call it a glass ceiling or a sticky floor, as one of my friends calls it, a thick layer of men. Uh, it's still, <laughs> it's it's very hard uh, to get through. But in so many places, and, and we try to lay this out, there's a chapter on the unfinished agenda, uh, and we can't cover all the issues, but we are plagued by many challenges still in the United States, as well as uh, women who are even farther behind on the journey uh, in other places. Uh, and it has to do with a, uh, a range of uh, challenges, including culture, including the lack of political will, the lack of power sharing, um, and that's why I think the evidence-based case makes such a difference. I can tell you from my own experience as ambassador, uh, when I would go and meet with ministers and leaders, so many times I had the sense, oh, they had the ambassador for global women's issues, how nice, uh, and perfectly cordial and courteous, but usually I got the message there was very little time to talk about these issues, issues which were somehow not the hard power issues, not the issues of the day, uh, and yet so critical to outcomes. But if I would say to that leader, I really wish we could have some time because I'd like to talk about how you can grow your economy or create jobs, all of a sudden the conversation changed. Uh, and put it in his, usually his, self-interest, um, there, there was a realization that, well, it's in our own interest, right. whether it's growing economies or uh, creating more profitable companies, whatever our interests are, women are absolutely essential for making that happen. You know, no country can get ahead if it leaves half of its people behind. And similarly, we can't grow our economy and create jobs and have inclusive prosperity if women are not part of of that solution. I mean, you make the point very forcefully that in having women in all ranks of an organization or a company is smart business. And that I think, six, that you, you tell many success stories. But where I think, you know, it's taken too much time. Uh, it is absolutely true that this is the right thing to do. It's certainly what inspires and guides, I would dare say, most of us that fundamentally it's about women's rights. But it is also the smart and strategic thing to do. And a lot of the book focuses on why smart, why strategic,
to win over those skeptics so we're not waiting 100 years. Or uh, having to, to go to Jupiter. <laughs> or have to go to Jupiter uh, to, uh, to really uh, move forward in ways that, that critically we need to. And, you know, there was just a, a study that was released in the last couple of days um, that some representatives of the um, UN Human Rights Council conducted in the United States about the situation for women. Um, and frankly, there are no surprises in it, but it's not a pretty picture in many ways uh, because we're the only uh, industrialized country in the world without paid maternity leave. Uh, we still, women still lose 23 cents on every dollar. And imagine if you're struggling uh, as you're the single breadwinner or a co-breadwinner whose, whose work uh, is essential. And it's bad enough that you don't have that equality at any level, but imagine what losing 23 cents on every dollar uh, represents. Uh, or the fact that we've got so many women in the workplace today, uh, half of our workers, uh, the great majority of mothers with children under one, and we've got a hodgepodge of childcare. Uh, we really have not made this an issue that is uh, viewed as critically important for this country. Uh, so whether it's the unfinished agenda around the world or the unfinished agenda at home, uh, clearly we have to do better. Uh, and I think we believe our collective action um, in ways that we perhaps haven't tapped it before, uh, arming ourselves with the data case, connecting, uh, utilizing the power that every woman has uh, and all of the, the, the men who share uh, a, a commitment to progress, uh, that we will get to a different place. That is the hope. It is an optimistic book. It is an optimistic book. In the sea of uh, bad news in many ways. But I would just, I would just add that I, I do think that we are at a unique place in time. You know, we talk a lot about Seneca Falls because Milan and I are both equally obsessed with Seneca Falls. And we think about sort of uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. You know, it took 70 years to get the right to vote, right? Explain to the <clears throat> students who you're so, talking uh, about. So Seneca Falls, which happened in 1848, was the first really large women's convention in the United States. It was the first uh, convention where they really talked about women having rights, the right, trying to get the right to vote, the right to own property, the right to divorce if you wanted to. So it was the first really uh, equal rights uh, convention. And it took 70 years from that first meeting, which was up in Seneca Falls, um, a small town in upstate New York. It took 70 years to get the right to vote from that date. And I always say that, you know, Susan B. Anthony traveled every week giving speeches, she went to jail. For, set, for 50 years, she gave a speech every week on getting women the right to vote. And I always tease that she didn't go by Lyft or Uber, right? This was like in the you know, <coughs> 1960s. Um, but the point is, is that it's been 100 years since then, and I think you both just made the point that we haven't made as much progress as we'd like. We are stuck at 18% every, everywhere in the world, as Milan said, the thick layer of men. But I'm very optimistic because, and I, I know Milan is as well, is because women are actually storming the ranks, and we're just below the CEO level everywhere. And the reality is, for anybody who's worked in a company, most of day-to-day -day decision making is done just below that level. So the trade-offs, the day-to-day trade-offs, the strategy, women are actually in those positions, and we've never been there before. So we've been stuck at 18% for a really long time, but we've never been so close to that senior, senior positions. So that's one reason we're very optimistic. The second is, as Milan just said, is because we know that world leaders, not just women world leaders, and not to say just women world leaders, but men world leaders as well, we've never seen in the halls of power before women's rights being discussed. It's just never happened in history. And what's different about right now is that the men who are leading companies, the men who are leading countries, they're recognizing that they want their countries to progress. They have got to unleash the talent of half the population. And we talk a lot about Davos because the other joke is that the shortest line at Davos is the ladies' room. Now, Davos is the World Economic Forum where all the sort of big corporate leaders go and big... And world big leaders. World leaders come together to talk about economic policy and, you know, things that world leaders talk about. Um, but the, the joke is that the shortest line at Davos is the ladies' room because, again, at Davos, it's less than 18% women. However, we were both there a few years ago, and Prime Minister Abe of Japan came to Davos, and what did he talk about? He said, if I want to grow my economy, I have to figure out a way to make the workforce accessible for women. I have to deal with childcare. I have to deal with the things that are holding women back in my country. 
Now I tell you, I'm, I'm not that, I mean, I've been around a while, but I'm not that old. To think, even in my lifetime, to think that the Prime Minister of Japan would come to Davos and talk about women, that's a sea change. And that's in the last five years. And I, Milan has a lot to do with these world leaders getting educated and releasing this, this research. But that research is critical. And so McKinsey just put out a report a couple weeks ago that if women had uh, equal access to the work environment, equal parity in the workplace, we could grow the GDP by 18 to 20, wow. $8 trillion dollars by 2020. So that's real money on the table, right? I mean, that's what we're talking about. If you don't believe in the rights-based case, do you really want to give up all that money? I mean, that's really what we're talking about. So that's the second. And the third, the third piece, so we have women in historic levels of leadership everywhere in the world. Yes, we haven't broken through the 18%, but we're very close. Secondly, we have the data, but the third thing is technology. And we're at a reset moment right now. Everything in our lives is changing. We were on a panel with the president of Google Americas, who's a woman, a couple weeks ago, and she said something that has completely blown my mind, which is that we've only used 1% of the technology that we'll use in our lifetimes. 1%. Think about how radically everything is changing around us. So we can change everything. I talked about Uber and Lyft, and I always say that, you know, I took a cab for the first 40 years of my life, because I'm a New Yorker, that's what New Yorkers do until I learned about Uber and Lyft, and now transportation has changed in New York City. We can do that. We can do that for childcare. We can do that for pretty much anything, if we're designing with that in mind. And so we can reset right now in ways we've never been able to. So the, those three forces converging is why we really do believe that we could fast forward, we could, we could leapfrog, you know, we could accelerate the 70 years that Susan B. Anthony had to travel we could change everything if we have the right mindset, and I think that's what we've been missing. Milan, um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, who has written on some of these issues, is adamant that we can't fast forward unless new policies and government action is taken. And, you know, you have been all around the world uh, and, you know, the U.S. lags in things like maternity leave and, and child care. And, you know, one, one of uh, the points that Slaughter makes in her new book I thought was interesting, since you were talking about technological change, Kim, is that uh, why are we still on the school calendar we are that was invented for an agricultural right. economy? Right. So, you know, maybe with a focus first here, what, you know, what will drive the, the politics to really get some, some new policies you passed? Know. And do you agree that that's a necessary ingredient because of course Sheryl Sandberg in some ways takes a little bit of a, a, a different take and says in Lean In that there are things within women ourselves that are holding us back. Well, I so think it, how it, do you? It's really all of the mm -hmm. above. Uh, government has to be a part of the solution and many of these policy changes uh, to cover large numbers of people who are impacted, the citizens of our country, is going to take government action. Uh, several years ago when I was working in the Clinton administration, we had the first ever child care conference. And I remember uh, that um, the First Lady at the time said, we need Bob Rubin, who was then the Secretary of Treasury and a former Goldman Sachs uh, person, we need him to open this conference. And I, when I went to Bob, I said, essentially that, and he said, what do I know about childcare? But symbolically, it was critically important because Treasury oversees IRS. Most of the ways that we do provide very minimal support uh, for childcare uh, expensed at, the, at middle income or uh, lower income uh, is through the tax system. Um, and it was a call to action both in terms of government policy, but also in terms of the private sector. Uh, we write in the book about the first law firm uh, that uh, is providing uh, paid uh, leave for, um, parental leave for uh, its, its lawyers uh, in terms of the kind of change they want right. to see. So private sector, government, 
Uh, the, both the have roles to play. Sometimes with the, the policies that some companies do offer, and Netflix recently announced right. you know, that they were right. going to give a year, if you wanted it or needed it, of, of, of leave. Uh, for anyone who had a new a new child, but um, you know something that a number of, of 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 analysts have pointed out is there's a problem if these policies are seen as created for women, and that at some companies even women are worried about staying out of work for a long time. That like men. They have to be policies that men y use as well, and that men have to like join, like Bob Rubin. Men have to be involved in the serious conversation. Well, and in fact, we see um, in the countries that are very progressive in this space. For example, the Scandinavian countries, the World Economic For Forum. We've discussed, but one of the things it does annually is put out a gender gap report. And what that report does is look at the gap between men and women in a given country on four me metrics, access to health, education, uh, economic participation, political participation. And they do it because the countries where that gap is closer to being closed are far more economically competitive and prosperous. And you would say, duh, you know, if you're going to un unleash half the talent of your population, you're going to get better outcomes. But the reason I'm mentioning it is because consistently at the top of the list, and this has gone on for more than a decade now, are the, are the Scandinavian countries who have very uh, enlightened, uh, generous policies in many ways, particularly when it comes to parental leave. And what they have ensured um, is that fathers and mothers take advantage of these policies so you don't, again, silo uh, silo them looking as though right. it's, I'm it's just... Right, I'm happy looking out that there are many men here tonight. Indeed, uh, and, and, and what, what, they, what they also did to ensure that is to basically work the policies in a way that the fathers had to take the leave also. Um, and what's interesting is how many... So it's mandatory. Well, if, yes, to take advantage mm -hmm. of the leave policy, there's a, 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 an equation you can work out. But what's interesting is how many of the fathers said in the process, as this has now evolved over a few years, I was depriving myself of one of the richest experiences in life because we were so tracked. Um, and, and I think that's, that's part of this as well. It does contribute to a social good, and it is something that should happen. But also, it enriches life, uh, and there's a lot more to life uh, than being a good employee. It's being a good parent as well, if you're in the situation uh, where you're in both categories. So men have a vital voice. They have a vital <laughs> voice indeed. And, and the voices are saying today, this has really made our lives that much better, besides the fact that uh, we're accommodated in the workplace. Um, but the other thing is, is the uh, extent to which um, these, these policies um, are increasingly being seen uh, for the outcomes that they're producing. Uh, and we don't have enough experience over uh, a long span, but, but, but they are doing what was intended in ways that, that really create uh, wider social improvements. You know, Mark Zuckerberg recently came out, everyone saw that, that he's taking two months paternity leave. And, you know, that's a great thing that he's doing because he's setting a tone in Silicon Valley, which is not always the friendliest tone for women, um, that family matters. And I think, you know, again, I'm super optimistic because I think more and more men uh, and women uh, of my generation and the generations beneath me are starting to recognize that they, they don't understand why we have these issues. It's just as stressful for a man whose wife has to stay home or is their, their jobs in jeopardy when everyone's really relying on two incomes these days. So, you know, we talk about in the book how it's a design flaw, that why is the school day nine to three and the work day nine to six? It's a design flaw. No one would design it that way in today's, today's economy. It just doesn't work. So I think we're at this point where we have to think about policies that are 
you mentioned the uh, agrarian society, but there's a lot of legacy policies that were modeled around a family that doesn't exist. It's not a model of how we live or work. And I think technology can change that. Um, and I, you know, so I, I do think that we, and I think men do see things differently now. I think we are at that cusp where even the, the ne next generation, the millennial generation, honestly, they don't even see, they don't even see differences in gender. They, when they go into companies, they're like, what do you mean you don't have a maternity policy? Or they, they demand that, and they demand purpose in their work too. So we're at this unusual place in history right now. Where you think it's changing? Well, because we can't tip it. I mean, I think we're in a precarious place. Mm -hmm. I think because the, the, the New York Times has had some recent articles mm -hmm. about men who you know grew up with mothers who were involved in the women's movement, and they thought they were going to be, you know, they vowed that they would be an equal partner in marriage and an equal partner in raising the chil children, and, and found that because at, at work, you know, we, we have such a 24-7 workaholic culture that uh, that it turned out, I remember the headline of one of the stories was, we, we didn't turn out to be the men we thought we'd be. But I think yeah. you brought an important point. It's a cultural issue, right? It's, a cult, it's the way we work issue. And I think Barry Schwartz's recent book on why we work and the way we work is really important. So if we can unpack why we do what we do and how we do what we do, we can separate out this, this, the gender issues as well. I think nobody wants to work 24-7. Nobody wants to live the way we're living. And we often talk about how technology can have us do what we do faster, or we can do what we do differently. And we have to, we have to seize that moment, and we have to not say, woe is me, and, and, and say that we haven't made enough progress. We haven't made enough progress. That's the underlying assumption. But we're at the cusp where we could. But there's also another issue here, and that is uh, choices that people make, and uh, particularly respecting mothers' choices who do want to spend more time at home uh, after uh, they've had a child, uh, maybe work part-time, work three-quarters time, but whatever the arrangement is. Uh, and what's happening increasingly, and we, we write about some of the innovative programs uh, that some companies have adopted to accommodate that, because people are living their lives longer today. Women are going to come back after a couple of years or so. Uh, they're going to be extremely, continue to be extremely productive, and they shouldn't be penalized in terms of partnerships or in terms of their, uh, the, the kind of ascendancy they can have in their careers. Uh, and what you find in some companies, for example, at uh, American Express, uh, there's a program where, where we, we uh, interviewed one of the key people there who said that she, in this case, was noticing uh, that, you know, the women found it much easier to work uh, four days a week instead of five, or three quarters time instead of full time. But in the process, she, she figured out not less work, not marginalizing them, but creating what she calls almost a brain trust within the company, where some of the most innovative work that's going on in terms of R&D and other kinds of things is is happening because of this cadre of a special force who will go back to working full time. Other companies are uh, doing enlightened policies in terms of uh, women who uh, ramp off for a while and then ramp back on. And what companies are realizing is this is our talent pool. We've invested immeasurably uh, in these women. They're going to come back uh, in, in after not too long a period of time. Uh, and they make it possible for them to quickly immerse back into where they were and also accommodate them so they're not pulled back in terms of their careers and starting over. But one of the attendant problems in all of this um, is not just the lack of the leave policy, it's the fact that in many places still, uh, when a woman does come back to work, uh, she often quits before she continues because she's mommy track, so to speak, and so not promoted, not promoted, not given the choice assignments, treated somehow somehow differently. When just a couple of years earlier, or even lesser period of time, uh, she was viewed as the top talent in you know in the company or the firm. So again, it's changing, and it's changing because companies are seeing today this is in their interest, uh, and some of the more innovative programs uh, are aiding uh, 
that process. And women are in positions of power. I mean, the, the, the example you just gave, a lot of times what we're seeing is as women are ascending to power, we say they're using their power for purpose and they're redesigning things. So that's another real important reason for women's leadership. The American Express example was put in place by a woman. And so we bring different perspectives and, and that's a really important part of our book. T tell me about, I mean, you t talked to and spent time with many fascinating women, some of whom were on the, the screen uh, in the introduction to our talk. And can, can you, you know, d d tell me a little bit about Dionne von Furstenberg and her commitment to these issues and her involvement or Gina Davis? Supposedly the first woman president we saw. It happens a up lot there. faster in yeah. the movies, right? Or in right, right, right. Well, you just but, two of our favorite people. But um, yeah, d d d tell us about first of all, them. This is a DVF jacket. Let me start with that. It, it, yeah, it's one, it, jacket. No, wonderful but, color. But quite seriously, um, I have been very lucky to have a front seat next to a lot of incredible women leaders. You know, I'm a generation behind these guys, and so I grew up watching them professionally and you know personally, obviously. Um, but DVF, I mean, I, I, these are people who are using their power for purpose in my mind. And I don't think I'm biased. I mean, it's not that I, I liked DVF's clothes before, but I feel so much more strongly about her now because I've seen her do things not in front of the cameras, but do things behind the scenes that nobody knows about because she really believes that she can use her voice for something bigger. And uh, I think her work is really about, you know, she supports vital voices, but she's also very involved in a lot of causes. I, I was with her in Brazil. And um, there was a woman whose daughter had been trafficked. Uh, and she'd been looking for her daughter for like five years. Um, and her daughter was probably by that point about 20. And there was uh, a court hearing um, and the perpetrators were not convicted, basically. And it was a very dramatic thing and it was very upsetting. And we saw the story, we had met her and saw the story. And we were backstage somewhere, you know, some, some kind of conference. And Dion took her aside and she literally took off her wedding ring no, she didn't even know I was there. She, knew, she, didn't see, she didn't think anyone was there. She took over wedding and she said, I'm giving you this because this is the luckiest thing I have and I'm giving mm -hmm. you this for good luck to find your daughter. And, you know, of course you see what she does in front of the cameras, but she's sincere about the work. And I think the people, a lot of the people that we've written about in, in the book are so sincere about the work. Gina Davis, she started the Gina Davis Institute, cjane.org, because she felt that the media, uh, and particularly Hollywood, was not uh, really treating women equally and she Yeah, started, you have a whole chapter about yeah, that. Yeah, and what's so book. amazing about her work and we talk about this a lot is that she one of the things that she found in her research was that in crowd scenes they only show 17% women generally speaking. Which is crazy, right? You have 50% of the population but only 17% of women in crowd scenes, which we think correlates what very nicely. What about the speaking parts? That was yeah. even Yeah. A more glaring. But the 17% correlates to the 17% we see in leadership. So maybe we're conditioned in some way to see 17% of women as normal. That's participation. And so I think Gina Davis has done a lot to use her celebrity to use and to create this incredible organization. But there's so many women in that book, women that you might not have, maybe not as famous, but right. who, you know, really use whatever they had. And I think that for me, that's the practical part of this book. And that's why we think we can fast forward now, because everybody has power. Every person in this room has power. You know, I, I, we often say that sometimes we don't feel we have power, sometimes we wake up and, okay, we didn't get the job we wanted and maybe we're not as powerful that we think as the next person, but we all have tremendous power. And if we each think about our power and we try to use it to advance other, other women and girls, we can fast forward. If we're waiting for just a, a top-down strategy, we're not gonna fast forward. I can assure you that right now. But if each of us tries to unleash our own power, we can do it, and I think these visible women leaders are showing us how to do it. But it doesn't, you don't have to be DVF. You don't have to be Melinda Gates to make a difference. You know, we can each make a difference. And, and, and the book has a chapter uh, devoted to women at the top who are doing it, where they sit within their companies or uh, in strategic roles they're playing. But it also has a chapter in women in the middle and right. the grassroots. Mm -hmm. And since the there are so many young women in this room, um, there are some wonderful stories, I think, that would inspire you. Uh, one is... Um, uh, there's a, a company that many may have, uh, certainly those of a certain age may recognize it more than others, uh, but uh, Liz Claiborne was a very big women's apparel company. 
And we tell the story in the book of the CEO who I had come to know over the years, an extraordinary, uh, generous, and uh, visionary person. But he was brought into the company uh, when it was floundering. And he really had to make all kinds of cuts. Uh, and uh, he had you know, this imperative on him. And it was not clear what was going to be on the chopping block. And one of the things that that company had done, and with tremendous impact, including on our own violence against women law that was finally passed in the United States, was to influence uh, the, why this issue needed to be tackled, tough issue, violence against women, particularly for a company to get involved in. Um, but the fact that it, one of the great elements they brought to it uh, was, yes, it's a human rights problem, yes, it's a health problem, yes, it's a serious justice issue, but it's also a productivity issue. Uh, and really laying out hmm. what the economy was losing in terms of this piece. But there was a young woman who worked there, and she had invested in this program, and she went to the CEO. I mean, she was here, he was here. Uh, and she got a, a meeting with him, an appointment with him, and he told me years later that she came in passionate about why the company should not let this program go, what it had represented for the employees, what it had represented for the brand, uh, what it had represented in terms of the general good of society. He said she made her case in such a compelling way. In many ways, she educated him. There's, he said, it's possible I would have cut the, 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 the nice project because I, was, I had a mandate. We had a go into serious cost savings. But here she was. She had an incredible influence on the outcome. Uh, and the company went on uh, to make uh, astounding contributions in this space. She has gone on to really make her life in this field uh, with a, another organization. There's a, a, another young woman who, uh, who has uh, created an organization called Girls Who Code. Uh, you know, this is a big issue. The, the, the lack of, or in, certainly in numbers, of girls and then women uh, who are not, uh, who are falling off of the interest in science and technology and math and engineering and, and so on. And uh, it's really instructive because at some point, you see this depreciation, and we go into this in the book about how technology can be leveraged for progress, and yet you have something happening where girls are not really inspired to stay in this field when they evidence a lot of interest in it. There was, about 10 years ago, it was so distressing, a bar, an addition of Barbie oh, yeah. that, that talked, and the, the thing that um, the company chose Barbie to, to say was, math class is hard. Yeah. They had to recall it. It's not very helpful, was it? No, not helpful. And they well, were called that. But when you think today that the majority of graduates in undergraduate university and, and even more in graduate, they're a huge number but only 20% are enrolled in this field. So something happens there. And we do talk about some of the people who have invested, who are making a difference from where they sit. And one of them is this young woman, uh, Rashma, who created a program called Girls Who Code. In the next five years, she That's will have cool. gotten to a million girls, enabling them, some out of the poorest circumstances, to be able to code. And what that will do to be able to channel them, to give them viable opportunities in terms of their economic well-being, uh, but to make a difference in ways that this country needs, innovation. Uh, so it, it, it doesn't, yes, you can be a, a, a wonderful person like uh, Dionne von Furstenberg or Gina Davis, uh, and they are very good women who have committed so much of their work in this space. 
but it's also about everybody else. And we try to do the everybody else's in the book too. It, it struck me in reading what you wrote about, about Dion von Furstenberg that what a vivid memory I have when I first became executive editor of the Times is that she called me up <laughs> and invited me to her house for, for dinner. It was just the, the two of us because she wanted you know, to share some advice and show me her support. And, you know, it meant a lot to me. Of course. Uh, and, you know, she wasn't doing it because she thought it would help her get favorable coverage in the New York Times. She was doing it because she knew it's hard to be the first woman. But that's what these women are doing. Milan, I have to say, Milan and DBF and Tina Brown, and I can name Justice O'Connor, Andrea Jung, all these women firsts. They've come across the aisles, they've come across corporate to government. I mean, that was the original, part of the original idea for the book was to show how women are cooperating in ways and really holding hands to move us forward. And I think that is the difference that women's leadership makes. Having these women work together. She has experience in government, Dion has experience in branding and fashion, you in journalism, coming together and say, okay, what can we do together? And they're doing it. But there are also people who remember. One of the strongest motivators for Dion is the fact that her mother was a victim of the Holocaust. Nobody knew if she was going to survive. Uh, she came out of that wrenching situation as fragile as a human being can be. And she gave birth to a daughter that was unimaginable in terms of her condition. That daughter was the one who is now giving back in spades. And I have now worked with her over several years because she was deeply committed to um, Vital Voices in, in ways that have been profound, uh, from simple things like designing logos to designing, um, you know, what, what the, the phrase would be that sums up the organization. She's always giving. But she says one thing over and over, which is the strength of women never uh, leaves her because she understands what her mother was able to do in the worst of circumstances. And she has seen women globally and at home, uh, not only whom she wants to support, but who are struggling, and she wants to somehow uh, be, able to, uh, be able to help them. But just one quick story, and I don't want to tell too many stories from the book, but uh, we, we recently a few months ago had a, a great, great moment uh, in Washington that we were able to bring together, which was to have the three female justices of the Supreme Court and the retired Justice Sandra Day O'Connor uh, come together in a salute to Justice O'Connor. And in the process, uh, Justice Ginsburg gave a tribute to Justice O'Connor. And she remembered the moment uh, when um, she had her first assignment on the bench. It was not the greatest case. Uh, but she got a note after she um, wrote her opinion and, and shepherded this process uh, for the first time in the Supreme Court. The new note came from her colleague who welcomed her as the second female on the bench. But the note was exactly what you described Dion did for you, uh, which is basically say to Justice Ginsburg, well done, my friend. It may not have been the best case, but you did a great job. And Justice Ginsburg said she has now done the same thing with respect to Justice Sotomayor and, and uh, Justice Kagan. And it's paying it forward. That's one of the things that's always impressed me I have been involved in so many programs, either in government or outside of government, that are mentoring programs, where women of great significance and others who may not consider themselves of great significance but are equally uh, giving have been involved as mentors. And each of them has always said the same thing, which is I got far more out of being a, a mentor than the mentee ever mm -hmm. got from me because that giving process, that paying it forward, was That's extraordinarily why I love teaching. <laughs> was extraordinarily rewarding. And that in some in substance is what we're trying to convey right. in the book. I also vividly remember the first time I was introduced to you, <laughs> which was at 
the dawn of the Clinton administration and early 1993, there was a women's event for all of the women that President Clinton had appointed and other prominent women in Washington. And uh, the, the headliner at that event was Hillary Clinton. And she wrote uh, a really nice foreword about both of you in, in, in the book. But the, the last question I have before we open it up to, um, to our audience is, you know, wh wh what do you think of her presidential campaign and what it means? Uh, and, I, I, you know, I, I might even ask you to predict. Because uh, she has been a friend, dear friend of yours for decades, I know. Well, she's, she's really an extraordinary human being. Uh, and um, any of us who've worked with her, worked for her, uh, will always recall those human things that she constantly does, uh, what she remembers, what matters. Uh, but beyond that, she's, um, she's really committed to public service. Um, so many times I've been with her. I, I remember one time we were in... Um, Austria working with women from the former Soviet Union and a group of women in tears came up to her from Ukraine and said please do something the women in our country are disappearing uh, they're offered good jobs and we never hear from them again we can't get anybody in the government to respond neither law enforcement at the local level nor the top of the government uh, and yet it's going on. And, you know, normally I've known many a politician or somebody in a public position who would hear that and utter some consoling platitudes. Uh, and this was a constant with her. She said, what was that about? What is going on? Uh, we've got to do something about that. And what it was was our first beginnings of the understanding of this massive criminal network around the world, a billion dollar industry, more than billions, uh, called human trafficking, uh, largely exploiting women, uh, but also children, also men. Um, and it was because of her constant cajoling and saying we've got to get to the bottom of this that led to the first ever uh, study of and it was one that the resources were with the CIA that was done in conjunction to understand what this was, the phenomena that it was, and it really, with the borders going away, with the openness, took advantage of the changes uh, that came from the, the end of, this, of the Soviet Union, but it's a worldwide phenomena. But I just say that because it's representative of how she sees the need uh, to really address the kinds of challenges that confront us across the board. Um, she. How did you first meet? She said, only says in the foreword, she's known you for decades, but. Well, the little secret or not so secret uh, is the fact that I was in college with her husband. And uh, he used to say to me uh, for years after, you got to meet Hillary, you got to meet Hillary. Uh, and I think he sort of sensed that maybe we would get along. Uh, and the first conversation, she was very involved in the Children's Defense Fund. Uh, the, the, the plight of children is a passion of hers. And uh, the first time I met with her, I think we talked for two hours nonstop and it could have gone on for days. Um, but, but I do think that uh, she's a formidable talent. She's deeply committed. You worked for her in the State Department, too. I did. Uh, so I worked with her when she was First Lady, and then I worked with her again in the State Department. And I've seen her, uh, and I've seen the respect that she commands. I've seen uh, the kinds of reactions she elicits. I've seen the seriousness uh, with which people take her. You know, and it's so interesting today, now that you've got the political campaign going on, uh, to hear all of the attacks on her. And yet, as a senator, she crossed the aisle repeatedly. That was one of the, the constant things one would hear about. Well, she's not what we thought she was. Uh, and, and work together with her colleagues on the other side. Uh, and 
as secretary, she got huge, huge um, praise and uh, the desire to be a co-collaborator with her uh, from many in the other party uh, who, when pushed today, they'll say things like, well, yeah, we did work together, but that was then. Um, so, I mean, I think that as a woman, the fact that we have a formidable woman candidate, um, highly experienced and committed, uh, speaks volumes. Uh, and I'm frankly happy that there's a woman in the Republican race as well, because I think um, there's a lot of talent out there in the other half of our population, uh, and it's time. And, and the question one is asked over and over everywhere in the world to an American like me and others who are um, in these kinds of positions is, do you think America will ever have a woman president? Uh, because others have managed to do it. We, I, w I would love to open it up to, to your questions, and there are microphones kind of towards the back in the two aisles. So if, if, if you've got um, questions about politics or the status of women in this country, around the world, please uh, don't be, sh be shy. Uh, you have you know, two fantastic experts here and two women leaders who really know what they're talking about uh, in, in this book. So please uh, approach the microphones. very interesting to hear many of the stories that you've told. I'm curious, um, my question is really based on the future and looking at the milestones that we have to achieve based on current trends, whether looking at regulatory or economic or corporate needs, and when, in your opinion, what are they, in your opinion, and, and when do you think we can achieve these milestones? Well. I think some of some of them uh, clearly have to do with what we know increasingly uh, from from the the research and data uh, that work that is everywhere. Um, look at the economy, for example. Uh, we know that women entrepreneurs, women who own and run businesses, are absolutely critical accelerants to grow economies. SMEs, small and medium-sized businesses. Are, are what the World Bank calls the missing middle. We need them to drive economic growth. Uh, if women entrepreneurs in the United States were a country, what they are providing to the economy would be com almost comparable to, Japan, uh, to uh, Germany. That is significant, significant inputs uh, into the economy. And I think there's there's so much role in that kind of space uh, that would be milestones in terms of that kind of growth, but women face obstacles. Access to credit is a huge, huge obstacle. Access to markets, um, to the kind of training and mentoring they need. So we devote uh, uh, time and space in the book to really look at what are some of the ways that those obstacles are now being dealt with, whether by governments or by others in the private sector uh, to, you know, major companies today, Coca-Cola, Walmart, major, major companies have made huge investments in using their supply chains, for example, to buy from women-owned businesses or creating initiatives to create m far more fem female entrepreneurs. Now, they're not doing it for philanthropic reasons. It's They're a doing business. it for the bottom line. It's a business yeah. investment, but they now get that. But that business investment has huge spillovers in terms of shared value, as Dr. Porter called it. That shared value is lifting up women around the globe who are touched by those programs. So those are some of the kinds of things, you know, when you look at uh, progress into the future, those are some of the kinds of things 
we need to measure and we need to, to understand what those outcomes uh, have produced and how long it's taking to produce them. I mean, I think a milestone is having a woman president. I would start with that. <laughs> I do think, you know, we're ready for it. We need it. Um, whether it's Hillary, I mean, I'm obviously a big believer in Hillary as well because I've also seen, again, not in front of the spotlights, what she'll do and, 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 and what she cares about. So I think we need a woman president. But I also think that there's two other things for me that would be big milestones. I really believe that the whole world is going to be designed through technology. And so if we don't have women in technology in those fields, we're not going to be able to have input into the way that the future is designed. It's not just about computer science. It's about the design of our future. And so without women having, you know, it was very interesting. When we were out in Silicon Valley, we had a small, we addressed a whole bunch of people in Silicon Valley, different companies. And there was one company, very profitable, very important company, that basically had, had a, a little lunch for us. And one of the folks at the lunch was a gentleman who ran a very important division. And he said, you know, I can't design products as if we were women, as if we were diverse. I need women and diverse candidates in the design process or we will lose. We will not be able to stay competitive. So I think it's that switching of the mindset that Milan keeps talking about, about seeing this as a competitiveness issue. And so I think a milestone for us will be more women in technology. And we have to change, there's a great toy to counter the Barbie, um, <laughs> Good. math is hard toy, called Goldie Blocks, um, which was put out by a young woman entrepreneur a couple years ago. And for those of you who have not seen, fast forward 2015 Goldie Blocks video that was released last week, I highly commend it. It's the same as the name of our book, Fast Forward 2015 Goldie Blocks. You guys are going to <laughs> love it. Um, it shows all these young women and what they could be in the future. It's amazing. And, and so I think there is this momentum. And I, I think the other thing that is going to be a milestone is this next generation. I think these guys are going to do things that we've not even dreamed of. And so I think the next generation keeps me very hopeful because, you know, we're kind of stuck in our own way of thinking. And, you know, we've been, we've been thinking about things the same way for many, many years. But these guys are being challenged to sort of invent the future. You know, 40% of the workforce is going to be freelance or entrepreneurs by 2020. I mean, people don't even want regular jobs anymore. They, they don't even want them. So we can sort of redesign things, and these guys can actually do it for us. So I think my... my my money is on them because I think they're thinking things that we haven't even thought of. I mean, there's like a three-year-old kid that I was babysitting for. You know, she's literally studying the alphabet by two. She could, she could read. <laughs> so it, like, the rate of acceleration is so fast. I don't think we have any idea what's coming. Um, but we have to infuse the right principles. That's the most important thing. You know, it's interesting. So many of the uh, people we talked to, CEOs in particular, mentioned the millennials and how the millennials are coming in uh, in terms of talking about whether or not they want to come to a company and take a job, a certain job. And they're asking questions that typically were never asked. Uh, what is the purpose of your company in addition to making the widgets that you make? Another, what, how else do you see yourself? Uh, how do you see um, diversity and inclusion, not just diversity, which obviously has, has tremendous uh, impacts and outcomes, but how included the, 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 that diverse population uh, works in a company and isn't just siloed by virtue of who they are. Or more Fa Fascinating stuff. Uh, one of the CEOs said, you know, we've never confronted these kinds of questions and we know they're the talent pool of the future. We know if we don't, we will not be able to innovate and uh, be the kind of driving force we want to be. So there is change. Uh, it's how it's harnessed. And I think the other thing that you mentioned um, about that is that they want purpose in their work. And it's no longer where people want to do good, do well during the week and do good on the weekends. People want to have purpose in their work now. And I think we can, again, change the way we work. And, and I think as, and that's a really big important part of our book, which is this purpose, is putting purpose at the center of what you're doing, because it does change the equation. And I think millennials are demanding that. They don't want to go to work, as Melinda just said, unless there's a purpose in their work. They're willing to give up the money for purpose. And I think that's a different equation than we've seen before. So uh, I think you mentioned Dr. Porter uh, of Harvard, who talks about shared value, and his whole thesis, he's the one who started the, the concept of shareholder value, or coined the phrase shareholder value. But now fast forward to today, he's talking about shared value. Companies can't compete unless they're making a social contribution. So 
the paradigm is shifting, and we're right at that cusp. Exciting. Next question. Oh my gosh. Ah, sorry, this side. Um, hi. What's your advice on a woman working in a male-dominant field? That's a good one. Could you working hear? Your advice on a woman working in a male-dominated field. Well, obviously, we, we want her to do that. Uh, and who knows, that field won't, will, will be more diversified than it is by virtue of her coming into it and succeeding at it. So it, it shouldn't be a put off. You know, we talk in the book about issues like failure, fear, lack of confidence. Uh, and I think sometimes there are all of the above when it comes to a situation like you described. You know, I just want be to say, persistent. Yeah. <laughs> we have a great part in the book that Milan just mentioned about fear of failure, and that folks who are in technology are encouraged to fail fast. Because if you can fail fast, you can change course. And if you're afraid of failing, you don't typically move ahead as quickly. And so that woman that she mentioned, Reshma, who, throws, who started that organization, Girls Who Code, encourages failure parties. Because we always, only seem to celebrate success, but we really need to be able to fail to succeed. You have to fail to succeed. And so that idea of not being afraid to fail and not being afraid of the word no, which is another really important thing. If you're afraid to hear no, you won't ask for things. So that's an important question that you ask. And I think uh, hopefully by the time you're ready to go into the workforce, there's going to be a lot more diversity in the workforce and you won't face a completely male environment. However, if you should, I think you have to be willing to put yourself out there. And I think you did just that by asking the question. So go for it. Yeah, definitely. It's sad, but it's 730, oh and uh, we kind of have to bring this to a, a close. So we'll have copies of Fast Forward uh, for you right outside uh, for purchase, and, and Milan and Kim are happy to autograph your book. And we can book. answer your questions uh, there. Thank you. Thank you all.